Hello there, everyone. Welcome back to some more... Let's play Underrail. I didn't fully explore this place. <laughs> Last time, I was supposed to do that off-screen. Well, whatever is still here can stay here at the moment. We just got done talking with Todd. It sounds like, and looks like, the only surviving member of the... Abyssal Station Zero down here, who has gone quite insane, but on that same note, maintained his humanity from living down here all alone and losing everyone he ever knew, and his wife, and it sounds like with her unborn child as well. Something happened in this research and development dome. And Todd's mental faculties prohibited him from opening this door until we could convince his other personalities to let us in. This consisted of his father and his mother, along with his father-in-law. The mother-in-law just yielded to the father-in-law's uh, opinion. After we had convinced them that Todd would be able to go in here without danger... He was able to bring himself to unlock this gate for us. We could have killed Todd and dragged his body here to activate the door. But Decker isn't evil. He's just a jerk. And I don't think that would have worked out. I've not worked out, but I didn't want him to do that. It was very sad. And to this day, man, I'm remembering trying to stifle back tears the first time I read... Todd's conversation with his wife in his head here, or rather out loud to us. God, he's been through so much, and I just can't bring myself to kill him, knowing what he's been through with any of my characters who have arrived here since that very first time with Garrett. In any case, all we know, or all Decker knows, is that something bad happened in here. Let's see what it might have been. We've been able to access, or well, we're not able to access, we have accessed all the other domes we are capable of accessing. And we know that the acorn potentially is here. This was the last place it was delivered to, according to the logs. At Bissell Station Zero, and here, the Dock Master's log indicates that it was delivered to the research dome. So it is someplace in here, assuming it wasn't destroyed whatever firefight occurred here long ago. Excellent material for fireproof clothing, as basalt fibers are highly resistant to. Rebars made from these fibers have a much higher strike-to-weight ratio and corrosion resistance. Wool for insulation, filtration as a hydroponic growth medium. Transparent metallic glass, a microalloy comprised of, is made through the process of aerodynamic levitation whereby the materials are suspended in air and melted with lasers. Expensive to produce, otherwise, theoretically, the entire Abyssal Station could have been constructed from. So they were doing some work with basalt fibers. Sounds like they were bringing down the basalt rocks that they found out by that one research station of theirs. What was it called again? Blistering Shores Research Facility. On the off chance, we have to beat the hasty retreat. I'm going to be leaving the doors open rather than shutting them, which is what I would normally do. I was tempted to not open anything down here. But it occurred to me that we might actually find some good quality crafting components while we are down here. So we will, in fact, explore a bit. 
Do I have what it takes to make W3C rounds? Uh, uh, armor piercing rounds, Tim. You should call them armor piercing rounds. No. I need some TNT. If you find any down here, that would be super useful to make some and get rid of the, the weight of carrying those that, that metal around. Strange mushrooms. Thankfully, there's no hazardous... Or, if there are hazardous spores, it looks like there'll be a long time in it affecting us. A catalyzing belt, that's worth quite a bit of cash. We will take that. We will loot everything, everyone. So, a good part of this early video will be actually just looting. A biohazard suit. 15 pounds. We don't need it. It can stay there. A symbiotic environment combining conventional aquaculture with hydroponics. Making the aquaponics. Fish, crustaceans, mollusks, hydrozone colonies... Biofilters, where nitrification bacteria can convert ammonia into nitrates for plant. I am going to swing my cursor around to see if I notice anything secret. So far, we have not seen a single thing here that we could interact with, that we couldn't interact with, by, uh, that didn't indicate it was able to be interacted with by holding down tab to see it. But you never know. Or rather, probably people do know. But I don't know. <laughs> I was here only once before on Ivy mode. Good quality cores. Can still hold an extra 52 pounds. I will drop that metal if we get uh, overburdened. Storage, huh? Sounds promising. A shield base. This is still stuck. Stuck. Things are in decent shape, despite how long this place has probably been shut for. And whatever nightmare happened inside this location. We s didn't do any of Todd's conversation, or very, very little of it on screen. But you discovered that there was a civil war down here between the people, uh, the Lemurians, from Atlantis, a different area, I think is where they were from, and the, and other um, Lemuria employees, not from, uh, not who were not from an, another underwater facility. I'm probably getting that a little wrong. I don't know if, I don't know if it, it consisted of both of those groups entirely set against each other. But uh, most of them, of one of these two factions, did work here in the Research Dome. They, one day, left the dome. Uh, so, I'm sorry, let me uh, back up a little bit. The, the Research Dome eventually, one day, was sealed and no one else was allowed into it, and no one left for some time. Um, I think it was a few months. It might have been a year, or maybe multiple years, but I don't think it was that long. In any case, when the doors did open, they were the people were changed horrifically. Uh, they spoke a strange language, and had, like, blood and runes carved into themselves as well. Uh, I think you can consider, like, what happened in Doom to have happened here. They began experimenting with some occult uh, substances or objects that they had discovered. One object in particular, I believe, was their downfall. And we will find it soon. A weird but oddly familiar symb symbol written in red on a piece of electronic paper. Yep, this is a clue to that thing as well. One oddy point for us.
Medsynth canisters in the manufacturing dome. Demand for drugs in treating various disorders in the native population, both mental and physical, due to inadaptability of living conditions. So that's the people who are used to living in this cramped, confined, underwater space, trying to help the people who are not used to this. Not for the sub-islander population, that is. For us. Yep. Okay, sub-islanders is what their name is. I call them uh, Atlanteans. Maybe that actually is, is their title. different toxic substances, but nothing we need. Between R&D and the remaining submarines and subspheres, no access to food processing dome. Through Residential 1, the time has come for... for my siblings, who sadly couldn't see the truth. Uh-oh. Yep, that's a small hint. We're gonna read... More so originally, as, as we've just read, started out innocent enough with various types of research being done. Now we have what sounds like something rather ominous on this computer. Just as he has expunged the invading submarine, tons and tons of suited slime in, in its place, darkening. Bring a fragment of that which gave us wisdom. Flatsomir's power, infinite. Sacrifice of human flesh and bone. Cut into pieces and arranged according to instructions while the liver is dipped into the solution. Blood collected in a bowl, mixed with shadow dust and sprinkled across. Ignite the crystal incense to cast shadow light upon. Should all gather around as the outside lights dim and change. Quality shield bits. Quality 120. I think we have better already in stored at home. But they're worth quite a bit of cash. They don't weigh much at all, so we'll take them. And it looks like this whole area is just a dead end. The gate controls are powered off on this side. Uh, but you need to leave this door open, Tim. This is the only way forward. We're very lucky that we've even been able to make it this far to the facility. Look at the destruction that happened around here. Remember, Todd hasn't walked in here for some time. He also, though, hasn't unpowered it. He's left just enough power in here to keep the place uh, functional. No one's been in here forever, so you better believe we're going to open all this up and see if there's anything special inside these rooms. Plasma Grenade MK2 and MK3. We'll take those. Bullets. Uh, I only care about the rounds we're currently using. Actually, Tim, you should leave that open, just in case you have to change your mind and run for some reason. is certainly something very interesting. Reminds me a bit of the obelisk from... Oh, what was that called? 
2001 Space Odyssey. Alternatively, and probably more accurately, it is like the Dark Crystal, and a piece of it looks like it's been shattered from it. Gate control powered down at the moment. A bunch more bullets, uh, nothing I really need. More ammunition. Nothing we need there. Oh, actually, there's a few armor-piercing rounds. Some bolts, we don't care about them. So they have weaponry stored in here. A focus stem. Very nice. We'll absolutely take that. Super health hypo. So they have some medical facilities here as well, apparently. Inside is a massive, dried-up human brain in that one organ tank. No power. No power. We're not going to be able to look at most of this until we turn the power on, if we're interested in turning the power on. A neural interface. Looks like a head scanner, or maybe a projector of some kind. There's a lot of exposed cabling, mismatch and makeshift components, and otherwise clear signs of an ad hoc approach to constructing and modifying the device the device. You see dried blood on the backrest. Hello! Various psionic mentors. Decent sci quality psionic components. Meg tracings. Magnetoencephalogram of a certain R. Jason's brain activating during high frequency 41.5 hertz shadow wave exposure as printed at the bottom doesn't look healthy one bit pacifier three pounds eight thousand value this cumbersome and clunky construction of the psionic headband suggests it is an experimental module it seems that their designers were looking to enhance non-lethal psionic techniques uh not for us We can turn the power on here, but let's look around first before we wake this place up. It depicts a, a gigantic serpent devouring a radiant sphere. We've seen another group of people who worship a, a serpent. And yes, they would probably be, as we will find out soon enough, uh, related. Liquid crystal slime. When motionless, the liquid is viscous and sticks to the walls of the container. Its sparkling reflection is richly colored. But when shaken, the liquid breaks up and turns into mate dry lumps. It remains so for a few moments, then it resettles and reliquifies. Okay, well, if we want to continue exploring every single inch of this location, we need to turn on the power. And there's now no turning it off. Let's begin seeing what these computers have on them. Welcome, P-Bridges. Unable to connect to ASIN. Only local data is available. Summon available servant. No available servant detected. Your request is in place in a queue. Alright, so there's no defenses activated or, sorry, present in this facility still. Good to know. Documents. Shadow wave psycho projection charts. Standard. Shadow wave frequencies. Less than 5 hertz, no perceptible stimulation, and no short-term effects. Between 0.5 and 3 hertz, faint, distant aureal beat in a range of 5 through 15 beats per minute, no visual stimulation. Theta, 3 to 8 hertz, deep stimulation of unconscious cognition, inductive reasoning, memory recollection, creativity association, 
language, etc. Alpha, 8 to 12 hertz. Sense of great relaxation and loss of sense of time and spatial awareness. Beta, 12 through 38 hertz. Lucid audiovisual hallucinations. Gamma, 38 through 42. Increased analytic cognitive performance, deductive reasoning, complex problem solving, etc. Upsilon, 42 through 60. Increased psionic performance across most disciplines. Exhausting for non psionic subjects. Severe headaches in extreme cases. Frequencies higher than 60 Hz are considered dangerous and should only be used with psionic subjects while exercising extreme caution. Shadow Dust Inhalation. Infra. Wait, no, that, I hit the wrong thing. No, I didn't. Okay. Uh, shadow Wave Frequencies. Infra, 5 Hz. Sense of vermicular motion inside head and abdomen. Mild headache and intestinal pain in approximately half of the subjects. Delta, 0.5 through 3 Hz. Alright, so they're doing the same test after someone has inhaled this dust. At, uh, as opposed to not having inhaled it. Violet pounding in ears. Sometimes accompanied by hissing, growling, and screaming. No visual stimulation. In Theta, creeping terror, distress, coldness. Alpha, sense of asphyxiation and claustrophobia. Beta, temporary loss of sight and hearing with the exception of sporadic audiovisual visions, most commonly containing flashing pairs of lights, serpentine motion, and indiscernible echoing sounds. Gamma, suicidal urges, madness, often leading to cerebral hemorrhaging and death, complete and overwhelming sensory hallucinations. Frequencies higher than 42 Hz will consistently result in death of subjects that have inhaled shadow dust. Psychoprojection Images Early Collection This folder contains numerous drawings by various individuals, ranging from simple black and white sketches to colorful portrayals of mind-bending objects, worlds or purely abstract concepts. Rounded, wave-like, or spiraling lines pervade the imagery, and triangles, pyramids, or tetrahedrons, depending on dimensions featured, are also common motifs. There are a few notable drawings. A transparent submarine dripping with black, slimy mass, beams of light illuminated from dark below. A human figure cutting the monolith depicted as being laid down horizontally on the floor. There is a black smoke rising from it and filling the room before falling back down as specks of dust. Some strange flying machine with large wings speeding through fog. Its dimensions and properties are written next to it. A man and woman with their hands reaching up. Tentacles emerge from below and hold them by their legs. Anatomy of a woman with some unknown markings on her vital organs. Her skin is colored green. Contemporary Collection This folder contains numerous drawings by various individuals, most of them disturbing in form and content. They feature twisted perspectives, strong colors that bleed into one another, serpents and other sinister looking creatures devouring or simply slaughtering humanoid beings, as well as creatures of other kinds. Some of these drawings contain formulas, occult rather than scientific, regarding things done to flesh that is often featured next to these inscriptions, drawn in one way or the other. Some of the more notable ones include Humanoid reptilians driving spears into a hairy, muscular, four-legged creature. They are in the middle of an endless pool of blood. A serpent constricting various objects, people, machines, cities, social bodies, and things greater, often titled as Sormir, or Flotsorm, or, merely, or most commonly, Flotsormir. A vortex of some kind, dark-centered and surrounded by people both alive and dead, all the living ones are bowing deeply, but the ones who sprinkling some kind of black dust all over it, the dead are never whole. Dr. Matal's drawings. The first drawing features a black background with a few white squiggly lines, some thicker, some thinner, nothing more. The second sketch is more elaborate. There are about 20 or so lines horizontally parallel to one another, with some having warm coloration, red, orange, yellow, etc. Either all the way through or partially until turning white again. They are shaped like sine waves with smooth, constant amplitude, but some waves are only uniform up until they spiral out of order and outside of the bounds of the drawing. 
The third sketch is more elaborate. The background is still black, but all the lines are colored without restrictions. Their mutual spatial relationship feels organized into a fully two-dimensional way, while their shapes are more varied in size and proportions. It's still rounded for the most part. Simple geometrical shapes like triangles and squares split in half diagonally are also present, as if emerging from some kind of fabric formed by the underlying intertwistment of multicolored lines. Yet the form is purely abstract and doesn't reference anything from the real world. This must be people's different drawings based on the waves they've been exposed to. The first being the lowest and so on, and it goes up and we're getting to see these pictures. The fourth drawing is completely blank. The fifth drawing can easily, easily be mistaken for a long lost work of abstract art. It is a fully colored three-dimensional painting of a warped land or water, or something completely different, with angular shapes of complex geometry placed on it, with a great sense of spatial awareness and proportion. The colors are overwhelming, as if the painter was compensating for the lack of vividness or some other inherent property, and many lines were drawn multiple times with slight deviations in their di dimensionality. You get the impression that the image is supposed to represent something, more, but it is difficult for you to discern what. The sixth drawing represents a cold, calculated organization of shapes, void of artistry and human emotion, a technical drawing in essence. The rounded shapes are predominant again, as well as a few merged tetrahedrons, and colors that are uniform in distribution and saturation. This is the first one that features text, formula that seem to describe properties of the drawn reality and relate them to our own. The seventh drawing is unfinished, being only about one third done. It is a chaotic am amalgam wow. amalgamation of all the previous works, containing spirals and triangles and half written formula. Its incompleteness doesn't have a sense of drawing direction you're familiar with. Instead, there are many holes in the composition. Certain spots just lack color, whereas some other spots are completely blank, and there is no discernible pattern to any of this. This drawing makes no sense to you. It also appears to be the last one in the folder. Neuron Mapping Set PPR The dark screen slowly turns purple. Colorful and detailed spiraling shapes of mathematical perfection begin to appear in the middle of the screen, becoming more and more concentrated in the very center until a symmetrical image finally gains form. The shapes repeat in different configurations and are self-similar, composed of smaller, identical, or almost identical shapes to itself, diminishing in scale to apparent infinity. Uh, infinity, sorry. The text underneath the image indicates that the image is being rendered in real time from some kind of mathematical function, and you are given the option to zoom further in. Let's do so. You zoom into the center. The macro shape outgrows the screen and reveals its fractal composition whose constituents then again grow larger and radiate away as you zoom in. Colors change and shapes reconfigure. The longer you stare into the infinite center, the more it feels like you're descending into new realities, losing sight of the previous obvious patterns and building blocks. From purple vastness, you fall into a spiraling azure sea, whose surface forms the maw of the universe that swallows you and squeezes you past the bright stars and into a quasar containing a layer of slithering green serpents between which clouds of glistening dust conceal scorching pits of molten rock, forming an ice island on which lush orange vegetation Homes of swarms of yellow, thousand-legged insects crawling around their monstrous black queen, whose single compound eye reflects floating polyhedrons, between which cosmic arcs of lightning wreak havoc, that disintegrate reality and funnel it into broken, into a spiraling singularity. Wow! Holy crap, that's an all one sentence! And it, yet, it's amazing! The more you zoom in, the more chaos you seem to see which is in fact a great serpent, you can no longer zoom in. And this computer? The screen is an, it plays an image of a dissected man. His body is twisted and atrophied, and certain patches of his skin feature reptilian scales. The... Savages here. Shadow waves on living tissue. Affects DNA replication. Dust into the bloodstream, which will accelerate the process and cause... Body molecules unknown. Tests involving reanimated dead tissue have proven... 
the label reads Neo Reptilian Brain. These tanks contain grossly oversized hearts with electrodes attached to them. We haven't looked at this, but I can't look at it. I can only touch it. Just like Garrett, when I was here long ago, I don't think Decker would interact with this crystal. From what we've read, the dust I think coming out of it might prove to be too dangerous if we inhale it. So we will stay away from it. Some kind of crudely constructed scanner. You can't deduce much from its appearance. Welcome, P. Bridges. Uh, documents. Shadowlith Archive must be what this is. This is a collection of collaborative scientific notes, reports and papers on Shadowlith recovered following shadow emission LEAD-129, which wiped out most of the data in the Special Laboratory Database. The collection is incomplete and provides limited corporeal insight to the most basic interactions between Shadowlith and our reality. It should only serve for archival purposes. Alright, let's go ahead and do it. Discovery. The Black Monolith. First, was first uncovered at the Abyssal Evac Excavation Site 6, exact year and date unknown, closest estimate between LE, BD-20, and 30, several years after the construction of Abyssal Station 0. The monolith is a 3-meter tall, deep black structure in the shape of a hexagonal prism, augmented with pyramidal frustrums at its top and bottom. It is composed of material so dense it required four heavy sublifters to bring it to the station. At 108 tons, its density was calculated to be 30.0016 grams per centimeter cubed. Wow! Transporting it from the manufacturing dome required reinforcing the floor with RG panels and using super lubric mats to eliminate friction when pushed by strong men. Composition test number one, number 142 and 143. Oh, 143 state is unavailable. The test was performed after an upgrade to the Nuclear Magnetic Resonance Spectroscope module in the hopes that it will finally allow us to determine the molecular structure of the Black Monolith after numerous failed attempts. To our dismay, but sadly consistent with all our previous tests, this one too gave us no results. The Black Monolith is impenetrable to all of our instruments and impervious to all tools with which we've tried to obtain samples. In agreement with Dr. Marison, we are ceasing all attempts at further testing the monolith's physical properties until means to obtain samples are provided. We will instead focus all of our research on the shadow waves. Dr. Leaf Botten. Shadow waves. A shadow wave is a transverse wave radiated by the black monolith, which during its first half period exhibits measurable physical interactions, positive extancy, but no measurable interactions during its second half period, negative extancy. In normal conditions, the change between positive and negative extancy occurs at frequencies of 0.2 hertz, meaning that the wave completes one full cycle in 0.4 Hz, with an average wavelength of six, roughly 16 microns. The points where ecstasy states come to an end are called shadow wave ecstasy limits, or more specifically, negative and positive ecstasy limits for each of the respective states of interaction. The extent to which the shadow waves interact with material reality is not yet known, but so far we've measured the more obvious electromagnetic interactions, effects of shadow waves on electromagnetic fields, by Dr. E. Herman Sigmarison. Some weak nuclear interactions, reactive decay at shadow wave excency limits, Dr. Tarbin Vorgeyer, and some strong nuclear interactions, quark cryodynamic permut permutations at shadow wave excency limits, Dr. Stor Oivinder, Unaccounted for increases and decreases at in mass and ecstasy limits have also been measured, but due to its inconsistent manifestation and magnitude, we've yet to draw solid conclusions with respect to gravitational effects of the wave. Most of the permutations and otherwise unexplained phenomena occur near or at ecstasy limits, whereas during positive ecstasy, the shadow wave carries energy in the form of a regular electromagnetic wave, starting at the negative and ending at the positive ecstasy limit of that period, in a somewhat predictable fashion, depending on properties measured. 
how the energy is carried from positive to negative, to negative ecstasy limits for all intents and purposes, how the wave comes into existence again, and why and how these limits, which can be represented as fields, cause these interactions, manifest in spaces yet unknown. What is clear is that changes in this electromagnetic component wave during positive excellency of the shadow wave is considered throughout its negative excellency, meaning that it is without a doubt the same wave that alternates between affecting and not affecting physical reality, as all of our research suggests, in quite possibly all of its fundamental aspects. The electromagnetic wave, which we've studied the most of all interactions, exhibits an unusual kind of elliptical polarization defined by Holdenstein's disjoint function. Informally, it has been dubbed the serpentine polarization, as its graph representation bears the likeness of a snake spiraling through space. All attempts at polarizing the wave in any way have proven unsuccessful, as the wave will be repolarized as soon as the shadow wave enters its negative excellency, meaning that, after passing the negative excellency limit, the EM wave will again have serpentine polarization. Hope that made sense to you guys. I got only a general idea of it. Shadow wave manipulation by Dr. Gustav Morrison. So far, we determined that shadow wave can be partially manipulated through changes in the electromagnetic field during positive ecstasy. This means that by giving the wave more energy at appropriate ecstasy limits, we can, for instance, change its frequency in a manner that is consistent with our understanding of the laws of reality. However, this also produces amplified and so far unpredictable quantum effects at excellency limits, both positive and negative, depending upon how the wave had been manipulated and the medium through which it passes. The shadow waves can be directed through space by guiding them into Orion tubes with a massive magnetic field shaper at the base of the monolith. In these tubes, we can shoot photons at specific intervals, aiming for either negative or positive ecstasy limits so that we may study the resulting quantum interactions, the consistency of Heinlein's law, and electron-positron annihilation their negative ecstasy limits by Dr. E. Herman Sear Meyerson. The process can be dangerous if too much energy is introduced, which has resulted in two accidents already, but controlled wave manipulation at positive ecstasy limits will create relatively stable changes in the wave. What quantum interactions occur at negative ecstasy limit like the creation of new particles, actual and not virtual, is currently beyond the scope of our understanding. Interesting. Sounds a little bit like the stuff happening in, uh, not dis, hexagen. Object negation experiment number five. This experiment was conducted to test the hypothesized complete negation of objects from reality with PSWB, Phase Shadow Wave Beam technology. The object used for this experiment is a standard sized pseudo brass cup suspended in an MQ, uh, M05 testing sphere. By channeling the shadow wave through two 5.3 meter long Orion tubes and introducing increasing amounts of energy at every positive ecstasy limit, this is all in caps by the way. We were able to achieve the desired frequency of 67.5 Hz for both waves. One wave is then continuously phase shifted in the range of roughly 175 to 185 degrees while the PSW is being focused on the cup. After the darkening effect has achieved, another energy surge is needed to completely negate the cup from existence, a process which occurred in less than 0.15 seconds. The experiment, besides proving the negation hypothesis, also proves Botten's principle that strong chemical bonds will ensure that the whole objects will be affected. In conclusion, the fifth test was a complete success, the only losses being the two Orion tubes and one MO sphere, uh, MO5 sphere. However, those could hardly be called losses, not because of the relatively small cost of the equipment, but more so due to the fact that the changes in their chemical structure and the formation of the unknown liquid crystal compounds will provide our team with new study material. Interesting. So they managed to get rid of, they phase the cup out of reality, and the things that the wave sounds like they passed through to accomplish this task were changed at some molecular level into some new substance that they, can, they wanted to study. Anamorphic disk. Today we received something called an anamorphic disk. It is supposedly capable of cutting the black monolith. It came in an external shipment, the details of which are oddly kept away from all of us lowly engineers. At first glance, it is a rather unimpressive rubbery disk 20 centimeters in diameter and 1 centimeter thick! Exclamation mark. 
gray in color, and a rough texture made of some unknown synthetic material we were explicitly instructed not to scan and to keep in cryo except during use. This thing is something no sane person would ever see as a cutting tool, let alone something that could damage an object as impervious as a black monolith. However, after doing some testing at the shop, we now view the anamorphic disc in a completely different light. The disc arrived with a setter SG-88 meter large diameter grinder on whose end it is to be attached. So it sounds like it's a very, very small disc of some sort. Which frankly gives it a comically disproportionate appearance. Speaking of comical, are we really expected to believe that such a primitive tool as a mechanical grinder with a rubble gasket at its end will achieve what the most technologically advanced lasers and plasma cutters at our disposal can't? These thoughts went through all our minds, and then we fired the thing up. Within the span of a second, the disc flattened while tripling in diameter, its gray color becoming much lighter in shade. In this state, the disc could cut anything we tested it on. Pseudobrass, steel, all the way to stronger alloys and minerals, even a G5 rated diamond, and did so with little resistance. I see. So... Although it wasn't very thick to begin with, only one centimeter thick, it still flattened entirely. And now it's like a buzzsaw. Uh, 60 centimeters in uh, diameter now. I don't know what that is in inches. Will it cut the monolith? That would be its ultimate test. We were instructed to modify a straw man to use the grinder and ensure that it is capable of performing the cut, taking all the potential variables into account. No idea how they came up with those, but what I what do I know? I'm just an engineer. Hopefully the cut will be performed tomorrow, after which I will file another report. Chief Station Engineer Boris Grayson. Well, it looks like it was successful, because we could totally see that the monolith has been sliced. Was that all that was here? Yep. All right, everyone. Well, we've been playing for 40 minutes. Most of that time has been spent talking. There's nothing else here I think we can interact with. We've looked at all the computers and read all the documents. We still have not found the thing we are here for. But now this door is ready to be opened. Holy parts! I'll take all of the good parts. So I guess we should take all of the electronic parts. There's no reason not to. Weaponry. This stuff actually is pretty decent if you're looking to carry any of it out with you. De a decent, decent level, and some of it will have uh, upgrades. I only, I think I'm only interested in any of the plasma weaponry. I guess we should take the lasers as well. They're worth quite a pretty penny. If you're not crafting, this will have some of the best level equipment. Good shock steel spear. Level 16. Nothing else is worth it. It's got burn marks that precipitate from the neck and spiral towards the top of the head. They emit a faint purple glow. That must have been what cut the shadow lith. And everyone. The acorn. What we are here for. What we are not going to tell. It is incorporated that we found. That's interesting. That shut. What are those glowing lights? Well, everyone. Something has woken up.
Those look like some sort of rift to me. That slight thing we saw is something coming out of that rift. It is, these are untargetable, and to my knowledge, I, th I, I don't think you can harm them normally. These require, I believe, I think, the Ethereal Torch to purge them, but we don't have that. As it moves, you might see it look like a serpent's head with a trailing uh, body coming after it. We can't shut that door. But we can hopefully shut all the others. We should see if we hear Todd anywhere here and get him out of here if we can. But I don't actually hear him anywhere. Okay, those are all the doors I'm able to, to close. Unfortunately, we can't seal off this area of the Abyssal Station. And I don't hear Todd anywhere. It's not possible for us to seal off the docking bay either. Well, Todd, I don't really want to leave you down here, but we got nothing to defend ourselves against that. Thankfully, though, Todd was smart enough not to stay around. A pair of eyes stare at you, tinted with fearful determination. Mr. Outsider. Nod. Are you sure you want to do this? He nods silently. Welcome aboard. He nods with a slight smile. Just don't touch anything. I'll get the submarine started. Navigation, course, uh, I wanted, I want to, I'm a, okay, maybe we can, maybe it will automatically bring us back to where we docked from.
Yeah, we can't input anything else. So we're, let's assume that it will bring us back to where we started from and dive. Destination reached. No, okay, so we do have to change it. So, uh, surface? We're, we're moving! Why is no questions? <laughs> I never noticed the blinking light here, everyone. should be a beacon here, but everything's dark. There's a lot of dust particles in the water, though. Something swam by. What was... Shh! How much? We're almost there. <laughs> oh. Is this the, the surface? It is. Now, about you. Me? This world is dangerous and will swallow you in seconds can't take care of yourself, but I can't take care of you either due to the nature of my life. I'll find someone who will, though. You stay here, and I'll be back as soon as I find you a new home. He smiles. Thank you, Mr. Outsider. I'll stay here. I'll be good. I won't touch anything. Good. See ya. All right, everyone. With that done, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go... Well, we should probably stop here. We've been playing for like 50 minutes or so. And I will go take my glow and go back to our home. Where I will store some of the stuff we picked up and do a little bit of vendoring. I will then see if I can find a place for Todd. In the past, I have let Todd work with the Black Sea Expedition. And I have handed him over to the ferrymen. I would like to see if there is potentially a different location for him to go to. So I will look around and see if I can find one. Either with the free drones, maybe at Southgate Station. Maybe we can have him hang out at our home. Uh, not as like a slave or anything, but someone to help us do, do some work. I will also ask at uh, JKK. And we will see if I can find anything for him to do. But if I can't find anything over there then we will probably have him go with the expedition camp. I think Decker would make that... Well, would he make that choice? We also learned that the ferryman doesn't have a family. I can't wait to record the next part until you guys watch this. So if you guys have a preference, let me know. And I will, if we get a tie, I will roll a dice. Otherwise, if you guys have a recommendation, we'll choose that. Thank you guys for watching. Hope this was interesting. I will see you in the next one. Take care, everyone.